Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Built for the Stage podcast. This is Joe Roscoe, founder of Built for the Stage, Broadway's number one fitness platform. If you want to try a free trial, go to the website, builtforthestage.com, or simply click the description uh, link in this episode. Special thanks to our producing team, the Broadway Podcast Network. You can check them out at bpn.fm. All right. Always a special guest, an exciting guest for you today. Uh, across from the pond, he's uh, currently just open Prince of Egypt uh, in the West End. Please welcome to the pod, Adam Philippe. Hey, Adam. Hi. How's it going? It's going well over here in Queens, New York and NYC. Uh, starting my morning off with you and super excited to do so. So thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we were just getting into uh, your opening night, the excitement of uh, Prince of Egypt. Uh, run us through that first off, like maybe uh, the tech or the rehearsal leading to opening night, just some special moments you might have had. And then, you know, what has come to pass these past couple of days? Sure. Um, well, we had about three weeks to um, we had about three weeks to get everything back together again, plus a little bit of understudy time for uh, for for us understudies beforehand. We had a few days because um, we had a bit of a we had a bit of a uh, disaster last year in terms of understudies all being thrown on in the last week because COVID was taking people out left, right, and centre. Um, so all of the, all of the lead understudies ended up going on in the last week with very, very little rehearsal. So they, they tackled that, um, this year brilliantly. We had about three weeks of putting it all up together and then, yeah, Thursday night, we, we opened again after, after 15 months, um, of, of theatres being dark. And I think we're one of the first ones out of the, uh, um, out of the gates not there's not many i think lame is up amelie's up jamie's up and i think there's not an awful lot more i think a, a lot kind of later in july a lot of our theaters are opening up because restrictions are going to ease again but uh yeah it's been it was great thursday night and um it was electric and just the the atmosphere you could tell that people were so hungry to be back in a theater and you know, our our show, you just have to take one listen to When You Believe. It's such a show about hope and, you know, finding your place. And I think a lot of us really, really connected with that. Um, and the audience ate it up, even at 50, um, 50% capacity. It was it was amazing. The energy was just incredible. Um, yeah, and I did, uh, I did Thursday night and then woke up Friday morning, ready to get it again. And... Uh, I got flagged on track and trace. So my castmates did last night as um, an amazing swing called Daniel went on for me. And I hear he aced his, uh, his West End debut and his swing debut. My castmates are doing two shows today and I am riding out a PCR test, hopefully ready to go back on Monday. So for anyone that doesn't know about the tracking or what you're maybe oh, yeah. particularly talking about yeah go into that just a little bit what happened what, what happened. track and traces so we all have um the nhs app the, the national health service app on our phones that basically will flag up one day out of the blue and been like you have been in the same space as someone who has come down with a positive case of covid19 you have to self-isolate and <laughs> you can't do anything about it you have to drop everything and go well that's how it is and our producers have been so understanding. Our team has um, provided me with a PCR test. Um, and it's actually a lot less complicated than a standard track and trace because I've come into contact with someone who is in a cast with someone who's been positive. So it's kind of second degree, if that makes sense. Um, so he, the middleman has come back negative. So we're pretty certain I'm going to be negative as well. Who knows? I could I could have it right now, but I'll I'm gonna find out later on today if my PCR comes back negative. And if it does, I'll be back on Monday, which I'm looking All forward right. to. Well best best wishes and we uh plan for that to happen for you for Monday. Um <laughs> let's let's rewind about uh opening or leading up to that with rehearsals. A lot of us in the States with performers, there's a lot of anxiety or there's a lot of like uh will this come back? Will I be able to 
perform in the same way that I used to? Am I going to be ready? Did you have those kind of emotions? How did you overcome them? How was it getting back on your feet um, once you know the the pandemic or the the lockdown was kind of uh, opened up for you all to start rehearsing again? Absolutely, those anxieties were there. Um, you know, to to go over a year without doing a professional gig, without doing an eight show week. Um, you know, I've 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 kept the maintenance going, but you can't put yourself in show condition when there's no show like you you can but you're going to peak at some point um and i don't know i really lost the motivation this year i just constantly being told it was going to open at this date and then it pushed back i just i gave up hope like i i was like i i will get myself ready when i know we are coming back and then obviously there was that anxiety because you don't want to start getting into show condition six months before the show because you'll you'll burn yourself out already so there was that coming back and very I've been very pleasantly surprised by how natural it's felt just to come back and just let whatever's going to happen going to happen and build up slowly. Yeah, we've had 3 weeks to kind of ease our ease our way back into it, which some might say is no time at all, but everything has come back fairly naturally and I think we're, you know, we're amazing as human beings the things we retain. Um so yeah, I I would love to ease some of that um, anxiety. It, it definitely will come back, and uh, fingers crossed, very soon. Um, you know, it's the old. It's one of the oldest professions in the world. It'll never stay down for too long. Right, right. Yeah, I I try to encourage my clients with that in saying that it's one thing to come into something with no previous history or training, and then it's another thing to come in with already. Uh, a foundation that has been built. And when you have the foundation, getting back to a 10 is a lot easier when you've you've been there before, as opposed Absolutely. to going from zero. You know, you're not starting from scratch. They're, they're, the body will come back to its true stride, its true form. So thanks for saying that. Uh, appreciate it. Let's get into a little bit about your uh, self-defense practice and your, your business that you provide uh, to, to people that are seeking uh, to learn self-defense. I'm very excited about this. How did you get into it? Tell us all about it. Well, my, my first love before musical theater was, um, was martial arts. It, it always has been. I started when I was four years old um, as a kickboxer and I used to compete. I got my black belt when I was, I think, 13. Um, so I, it's really been a part of my life since I can remember. And I've always tried to incorporate martial arts into the performing world as well. Like I'm the fight captain for Prince of Egypt. So just like a dance captain, um, you know, maintains the choreography of the show. I do that with the fight choreo, the, the fight choreo. So that's, that's really re rewarding as well. And I really like that extra responsibility, but there was still something missing. And in lockdown, I decided that that was my thing that was missing. There was a couple um kind of unpleasant trees in the village in terms of like muggings and stuff like that we live in quite a nice area but you know it happens everywhere doesn't it so there was a couple of things like that and it really got me thinking there's 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 a hunger for this people want to you know especially with um i don't know if you guys heard about sarah everard um the girl from clapham in london who got abducted recently, there was a massive cry for the fact that a lot of, uh, particularly women, don't feel safe at past a certain hour or walking alone anywhere. And there was this massive outcry for it. And that has kind of been a real push for me to 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 get on with it and to teach it and to get to become licensed, which I have this year. Um, in the lockdown, I got my I got my insurance, I got my license and yeah, I've been I've been teaching people for a couple months now. That's great. A lot of people have this story in the pandemic of where it 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 I don't want to say it forced them, but it it encouraged them, I guess, if you will, to go after those other things that they have aspired to or have put on the shelf for a little bit. Um, what got you to take those first couple of steps? Because a lot of the times getting started with something, the difficulty is just getting started. So whether that was like 
getting uh, licensed or other steps you had to take? How was that getting started? And like, what insight could you share with us that might help others out there listening that have something on the shelf that, that they just can't quite get going with? Um, do you know what, for me, it was quite specific for me because I, before the pandemic, I was thinking about this and I was offering it as kind of like a goodwill non-profit community service but i ran into obstacles left right and center you can't use our venue if you don't have insurance we can't be liable xyz so i was like well that's kind of died a death hasn't it and then when the theater shut down i went well now this is my this is my chance to do it almost like you know i kept telling myself i didn't have the time and then when everything dried up i was like well now i do no i definitely have the time Um, but they say the hardest part of going to the gym is putting your trainers on, isn't it? So, you know, it's, it's persisting. It's, it's getting past that first stage and having things snowball after that. So, um, you know, I, I'm an advocate for not having, um, a million alarms on in the morning, because I think if you, if you have one alarm and you get, and you force yourself to get up with that, you're up you're forced to be up and the day will then pan out. Cause I, I would stay in bed all day if I hit snooze and snooze and snooze. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my kind of very vague advice in that I, 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 I ran out of excuses and I just said to myself, push past this. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to take exams. And I'm so glad I did. And I'm so glad I did it in the hiatus because now I'm, I'm licensed. I have to renew it obviously every now and again, but, this is something that I can run on my days off on my Sundays. And once restrictions ease up, I'm going to get back to having a club on Sundays, which I'm really looking forward to something that's not to do with theater. Yeah. That's oh, let's get into that in a second. I love what you just said there about that. Uh, something that has uh, not to do with theater, but that advice you just gave about, you know, the hardest part of uh, the gym is just putting on your trainers. I love that. Um, we'll probably use that as the cold lead in for this episode. Um, I love it. Right. Um, what I wanted to ask was obviously we can't do anything uh, physically. We're not in a room together to show people that are listening, but is there any like verbal advice you could give to someone? Like if they find themselves in a dangerous situation or, or something, what are some like uh, off the top uh, cues or tips that you could give to people listening? Sure. Um, I mean, look, it, it, it's a it's a muscle that you have to to train. There's no kind of like slap a band aid on that and it'll work. Um, however, my my main thing that I always teach is self defense is when you're being asked of something that you're not prepared to give up. And that is a that's a conversation that you have with yourself. If I'm if I met someone, if I was like your average Joe Bloggs, and I met someone in the street who was like, "Give me your wallet." What's worth more, my wallet or the idea that something could really badly happen to me? Um, You give them the wallet. You know, it's always a decision with that. And we don't like it, but uh, you're worth more than a wallet or a phone or, you know, a bag or something like that. What I really specialize in is when the price is too high to conform to. Um, So that I think is your, that's my number one is you have to figure out if what you're being asked of or what the, 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 you know, the attacker in this altercation is demanding of you. And if it is worth more to try and if you have no other option, if you might as well try and fight back, that's what I teach. Cause at the end of the day, if someone asks you for your phone, it's less hassle to give it to them than it is to get into some sort of fight, especially if you've not been doing kickboxing since you were four years old. Now I was, I actually, um, was a victim of an attempted mugging about four years ago now, um, right outside my home. Now, that's a different story for me because I have been a competitive fighter for nearly nearly two decades now. So it's a different question for me. In that situation, it was less hassle for me to find a new wallet than it was to teach two kids a lesson, you know? So it's about you and it's about your relationship with self-defense. If it's a muscle that you've trained, obviously there's more um, possibilities for you to 
do with it. But the for your average Joe blogs, it's a question of asking, am I prepared to give this person what they're asking for? And if not, that's when you may as well fight back. Right. So what the service you provide, it's obviously for when you're protecting your life or your physical well-being and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I'm not I'm really not one for materialistic things. I I the things of value in my life are relationships, experiences with each other, and that's what that's what my style of self defense protects. I like I couldn't care less if you buy got nicked. Obviously there's a there's a traumatic aftermath of that, which I do deal with in my sessions. You know, there's a recovery from having an incident like that. And half of my um a quote that I that I that I use a lot is it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war, which essentially means having the knowledge and having the confidence that you could deal it with a situation is half the fight. If you can walk with that confidence and not spend your energy on, is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Am I going to be okay? If you can walk with the confidence knowing that you probably would be, you know, nine times out of 10, nothing's, nothing's going to happen to you. And on that one time out of 10 that something might, you can then apply it. That's my whole image. I, uh, I'm stealing that quote as well. I love that. Um, and that's, it's, um, that, I mean, that's not me. That's, uh, that's, no, I no, no. Oh, yeah. San, San I think said that first, but, uh, I, I definitely use it. Yeah. It's something I, I, it's one I haven't heard. So love that. And it's also applicable to like, so many other things than just self-defense, yeah. just that state of readiness um, and taking yourself to another level, regardless of you having the opportunity to use it at that given moment or not. Um, let's close out the episode going back to what you mentioned with uh, balance, um, meaning like you had said the importance of having something outside of theater. Um, how does that? How do you apply that on a, on a, a daily, weekly, monthly, everyday basis um, in your life, so that you can allow yourself to step away from theater, so that when you come back in, you're all the more you're you're better for it. Um, I think this is really important. I tell people a lot, like, "Hey, I rather you be a person that does theater as opposed to a theater person, um, because you're a person first. So tell us a little bit about your personal perspective with that. Absolutely. And I think this is very near the top of the list in jobs that you can get completely submerged into and completely lose yourself. And I think this year has put that massively in perspective for me. And I've, I was having this chat last night, actually. I, did, I had moments along the way of being like, what I do is I, I dress up and I sing. And when it was, you know, when it was the conversation of um, early last year, when a theatre's coming back, I'm like, let's just make sure the NHS is fine and funded first. We Like, yes, I miss my job, but there's a difference between surviving and thriving. And I think the line gets blurred sometimes, but theatre sits in thriving. It's culture. It's It's food for the soul. It's not like nine times out of ten, it's not the thing that's keeping our heart pumping. And... I think realizing that this year has made me take a step back and say, I do massively value what I do. And I do think it has a very valid place in society and in, and in the cultural world. However, it can't consume me. I have to be a person and it has to just be a job. It can be a job that I adore and I want to get up and go to every day, which I think if you can find a job like that, you're, you're winning. But, you at the end of the day a job should fund your life you know if we're taking it right back to the, the building blocks of what a job is meant to be it's supposed to fund your life and if you don't have a life because you're you know it, it is possible to be a workaholic in the theater industry without sometimes even realizing it yeah love that love that all right well everyone listening find that balance find that uh love and passion outside of just theater. And I guarantee you it'll bring a freshness and uh, a newness and a appreciation even more so for your craft. So Adam, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate getting to know you. And yeah, uh, it's lovely to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Best wishes with the show. 
And yeah, uh, everyone, just check out the description of this episode. You can find Adam's Instagram handle there and other ways that you can uh, learn about what he's got going on. Also, his website for his self-defense uh, service that he has. So, Adam, thanks again. Appreciate you. Thank you, mate. Everyone, thank you again for listening to Bill for the Stage podcast. Once again, if you want to try that free trial, go to the website, billforthestage.com. All right, until next time, Joe Roscoe signing off.